Thank you guys all for joining. Greatly appreciate it. If I mispronounce a name, please yell at me immediately so I don't make the mistake twice. Uh, but uh, uh, I've got here uh, Mike Bowery from 10th Street Management. I've got Carl Hensel from Kings Road Merchandise. Ben Brennan from At Venue, Spencer Charnas from Ice Nine Kills and Cleaver Clothing, and Ian Dietrich from 10th Street Management as well, correct? Uh, thank you all for being here. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, we're going to be talking today about merchandise and just all the, uh, uh, yeah, how we can solve everybody's problems to drive revenue during a time when uh, touring has uh, gone ground to a halt. Uh, so, Ben, I was hoping we could begin with you, if you don't mind. Um, like, I'm sure you're always thinking in terms of short and medium and long-term strategies uh, for revenue generation for artists. What's your opinion on the short-term opportunities in merchandise right now? E-commerce. You know, um, you better have a damn good e-commerce strategy right now. Um, find creative ways to drive awareness, drive traffic. Um, you know, just chatting with everybody in and around the, specifically around the merchandise industry, it's, it's you know, we don't know. Like, there's just a lot, there's so much ambiguity as to when we're going to come back uh, to live events. And so, buckling down and being ready for the long haul, uh, merchandise is a critical revenue stream for all artists. I'd say, you know, if you didn't have an e-commerce game that was on point, it's time to definitely figure out who your right partners are going to be. Uh, come up with interesting strategies and it goes beyond just selling stuff online but what are some interesting marketing initiatives that you guys can you know come up with and limited edition and exclusive offerings um, so that you can build awareness drive traffic and ultimately you know generate some revenue during this downtime you're muted <laughs> Uh, sorry about that. There we go. That seems to roll right into your wheelhouse. So, like uh, live performances are almost a like a pool model for uh, selling merch, and online has always been more of a a push model where you you know there has to be some marketing and that sort of thing involved. Um, so, is there a, a a pool model or a soft sell or a, a marketing free merch model for online that works? I mean, I think each band is different, um, you know, from our perspective, like all the marketing you can do. And, you know, I'm curious to hear, especially from Spencer and Mike and Ian too. Um, but so much marketing goes in, like so many people talk about marketing. So many people are like, okay, we got to do these good ads. We got to do these boosted ads. We got to do this on Facebook. We got to do this on Instagram. And that stuff definitely helps. But for us, over 50% of our traffic day in, day out is either Google organic. So people just going into Google, like, band name t-shirt or uh through our mailing list you know so customers we had already reached previously that uh you know knock on wood we didn't screw their order up and and they're already in they've, they've already bought from us you know and they've opted into the emails like we we don't email people who obviously opt out and uh so for for a lot of online merchandise i, I would say it's probably about 50 50 in terms of push versus pull you know um the greatest motivator is somebody typing your band name into google they already have in their mind what they're looking for. You know, maybe they don't know what the actual design is, but they know like, I want to get a shirt for this band. Um, and I think right now, I mean, for the last two months, we're starting to change our strategies a little bit. We've gotten a little less trigger, you know, shy in terms of how do we announce? What do we announce? What's the best wording to announce it? You know, keeping in mind there's a, you know, global pandemic and borderline, you know, <laughs> catastrophic Great Depression style unemployment crisis happening how do you advertise band shirts, you know, in a way that doesn't make it seem like you're just totally tone deaf. And I think in a way, you know, for us, we've been pretty lucky in that every situation that we've promoted for the last two months has had some point or purpose that's relevant to the band. And, um, you know, I think all bets right now are kind of whatever we did, you know, April last year is totally different than what you would be doing now in terms of what's okay and what's, um, the right marketing message, you know, cause I mean, we, you know, Spencer, you guys were on tour with Papa Roach and uh, that tour ended before it really got to hit the home stretch. So there's a lot of bands that had excess merchandise in Europe. There was a pretty tasteful way to go live and go, Hey, this tour got canceled. We normally don't do this this soon, but people really did throw their support behind bands in a way that 
you know, normally the joke, you know, with us is that tour merchandise, it's dead on arrival. You know, I mean, it sells okay, but if it's got a tour date on it and you're not selling it at a tour, if somebody didn't go to that event, they're not going to care, you know, but then we had a lot of bands who didn't actually go on the road. So they didn't want to announce anything for a while because they had friends who lost tours. They had friends whose tours got canceled right before they started. And so I think that, you know, each situation, whether you're, whether you're really putting out this totally compelling line or whether you're just saying, Hey, here's some shirts. Here's what happened to us. Your support means more now than it ever has. Um, you know, and, and in a way you just kind of have to do that to what feels right right now. I don't know that you can really predict any of the economic outcomes. Um, yeah. you know, cause they're changing so quickly anyway, but it's also just, you have to do in the same way, like you write a song that feels right as a, as a, as an artist, you have to sometimes just put a message out that feels right because it's not as simple as just like, Hey, here's a collage of merch on a, you know, square panel and Instagram come by. Like, I don't think that's, I don't think anybody's really going to give a damn about that right now. Spencer, can you talk about that? How has, how have you been messaging your merch and, and, and to your fans and uh, especially in, uh, in the wake of uh, having a success merch at the, uh, after an abbreviated tour? Have you massaged your messaging in any way? Like what Carl's talking about. I think for us, it was a combination of, of doing business as usual and, and trying to always make an event out of our merch drops. You know, it's not just we're throwing up a shirt and a hoodie and check it out. We developed uh, a system that for me was inspired by the Supreme business model. You know, I would be eating lunch on Fairfax and, and just see hundreds of people lined up the street waiting to go to Supreme. And, and I'm thinking, what, what, what the hell are they selling in there? I don't know, is it crack? I, I don't know what they're selling. And just did a little bit more research and realized that it's, it's, it's pretty simple. It's not, you know, rocket science. It's they're doing things where everything is limited and they've built a cult following around that. And that's really the business model that we adapted. Um, you know, we're fortunate in the sense that we really have a theme to our band and, uh, it all revolves around horror and horror films and, and these recognizable characters and, and us putting our own spin on that. And uh, we, we developed this thing called Nightmare on the Ninth where it's a limited drop every month on the ninth and people collect them. You know, we, we, we were pretty regiment about not reprinting those designs. And if we do, they're on a different item and they're in a different way and, and never again online. And so we've really built up that demand. And uh, I always approach that stuff as a fan. You know, what did I want from my favorite bands or my favorite horror films growing up? And that's how we approach it. And as far as the, the pandemic and, and adapting to that, we definitely looked at what kind of items are going to be virtually useless to people. Like no one's going out to the beach really and if you are you're an idiot if you're watching this um, <laughs> um you know we're not going to be printing bathing suits we're not going to be printing towels no one's running out uh to get it get that kind of stuff during a pandemic so we we, we changed uh, some of the items like instead of doing a bathing suit for summer we did a blanket that you know people would have around their house and i think approaching it in the sense that you have to know your audience and you have to know the climate in which you're, you're selling in. And also you, you got to be philanthropic too. We definitely didn't want to just come out of the gates and say, gimme, 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 uh, because everyone is, is suffering now. So we definitely did a few drops um, where we were donating the money to a various, uh, you know, uh, pandemic relief funds and uh, we were able we were able to raise some money for the band members themselves and for the crew. And I think it's just, uh, it's a combination of, of knowing your audience, uh, making things feel collectible and, and also, you know, as you not being tone deaf, you know, being able to support uh, people who are in more trouble than you are. Ian, I love what Spencer was talking about, about making every merch item an event. Uh, uh, is how is that something that you might use for some of your clients or you've done in the past? What, what, what kind of like, you know, does it, does that spark little spots off in your brain? Like it does for me when you hear that idea. 
it's the right idea. I mean, Spencer and Carl both have been 100% correct that if you're not making products that, you know, create some sort of shock and awe and or the marketing that surrounds it creates some sort of shock and awe, you're not going to be noticed. You know, everybody's sitting at home currently scrolling through an innumerable amount of posts and, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ways to get at you, you know, whether it's Zoom or Instagram or whatever you're expected to do nowadays, if you're not creating items that are going to stand out and that also speak to your brand, you will fall by the wayside, unfortunately. Excellent. So when you talk about like items that stand out, is there anything product wise that for you is, is like, what, I'm surprised not every merch table's got this, you know? <laughs> um, you know, it's, it really varies from band to band. It's, we all we all pretty much joke within our, our circles here, especially in the rock business, that we're in the black t-shirt business. So, you know, that's the core item and you build from there. Um, as far as items that, you know, that every merch table, you know, should have, it's something that addresses your audience. It's your, it's something that you know your audience, um, you know your audience buys and, you know, if, it, it, it's really just about understanding what your brand is and then creating an item that speaks to that. Ben, uh, uh, Mike, I got to get to you, uh, but I, I got to post this question to Ben. Real quick, <laughs> it seems like right up his wheelhouse. Like, like there's, there's got to be a fine line between those items that fans are going to love. And so therefore we got to have them, but also those items that just have got such great margins that you got to have them, even though you might sell less. Is there anything that you look at that just is like one of those like items that, uh, yeah, same sort of question. Like it's just the margin's so great and the op that the opportunity is so good. And kind of to what Ian was saying, it really depends, I think, on the band, not to be ambiguous, but it depends on the band and the genre, you know, um, and there, there are the, the black t-shirts like, you know, we just did a industry analysis before 2019 that highlights a lot of the, we did 125,000 shows last year. What does the data say and what's selling and what isn't selling your top grossing items? And it doesn't matter what genre you are, it's the t-shirt and it's a black t-shirt period, you know, and that's just what the, that's what the fans are buying, you know, and, and up beyond that, it's the black t-shirt with the tour dates, right? It's your number one seller across the board. Um, and the top, you know, out of all the shows on the average, four items generate 75% of your gross merchandise. And, you know, those four items are t-shirts, you know, so you need to be strategic and smart about, you know, what it is. Now, you know, I always love to give an honorable mention to the koozie in the country genre, right? Because the koozie is the fifth or the, I think it's the third most selling item at the merch table. It's, you know, what, what do those things cost to make? Like, you know, 10 cents, you know, uh, for a koozie and you sell them for five bucks a pop. I'll take the $35 t-shirt, throw that in here. Here's two twenties and I'm out the door, you know? So, you know, for, for each genre, there are those, those trinkets and those elements, but you know, we've seen artists go out with these really unique, um, uh, uh, merchandise items that are specific to the band and they resonate with fans. And I think you can do that and make money doing that. And it's a cool item, but know that that's not necessarily where your margin is going to be. And you're not going to sell a ton of those things. Don't overdo it on that. And I think that's where e-commerce, you know, lends a lot of creative opportunity and exploration on like what, you know, we were talking about before about these specific items and, and doing these exclusive, um, it depends on the item, you know, it depends on the genre, you know, um, but not to, not to put all your eggs in that ba basket, be strategic with your merchandise line, know what the fans want, you know, um, because that's a really cool item that can sit on my shelf. But as a fan, I want to wear, that band t-shirt to school, you know, I want to, it becomes a part of my identity, you know? Um, so, so yeah, this, but as we were saying, I think e-commerce, there's a, a bit more opportunity to be flexible and have limited runs and exclusive um, items for it. Mike, I know that like, you know, we, we've talked a lot about it. It's very specific to the band and there are things like, you know, a, a guy is not going to wear a picture of another guy's face on his shirt. <laughs> But a woman will wear a guy's face on the shirt, you know, that sort of thing. So, like, how do you as a manager get strategic or just be really sensitive to not only great design and making sure that it aligns with an artist's brand, but also is something that will sell? 
Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Thankfully, you know, the four others besides you and me are all guys when I'm helping, you know, in this case, Ice Nine Kills design their line is, you know, I talked to Ben about, you know, some of the broader picture global things that are happening for him. I talked to Ian who manages other clients at 10th Street and has a wealth of knowledge from working in the merchandise business, you know, before he entered the management game. I talked to Carl who I've known for a really long time who's had his ear to the ground and, you know, works with uh, bands in different genres. And so my job is to really take the data back um, to someone like Spencer and say, hey, look, this is the report that I'm getting, um, you know, from other people. And then, you know, let's see what we want to do with this. And, you know, part of the beauty is, uh, you know, it's really nice to know from a guy like Ben who's, uh, you know, said whatever, I think 125,000 shows that he can analyze and say, hey, 75% of the of the business is done on t-shirts. Now we, of course, in Ice Nine Kills Camp always like to think that we're the exception rather than the rule. And because Spencer's done such a good job of creating, you know, this um, really dedicated fan base, that other 25%, we try to super serve with really unique items, right? With the idea that if we super serve them, they go and tell all their friends who then puts them into that pool of 75%. And as that pool, you know, expands, the overall numbers increase. But um, yeah, I mean, it's really helpful to just have these, these resources to, to collect the data and share. Ian, I want to talk about something that Carl was, uh, uh, both Carl and Ben have been talking about in depth as well as Mike as well, um, about online sales and where the online sales opportunities are right now. Can you talk about third party retailers and where opportunities might exist, especially for artists who might not yet be at the kind of level that a, a King's Road, for example, would be interested in taking them on, but there's still opportunities. Is eBay still a thing? Is, is it Amazon or is it you really just have to build your own website? Yeah, I mean, honestly, my, my uh, suggestion to anyone who's trying to actively build a brand is to start with your own. The, when you step into third-party retail, what you're doing is giving that entity control of the experience. And that's what you re don't really want to give away. Spencer and Einstein Kills, tremendous job of controlling their experience. Every detail on the page is very succinct. The, you know, the skinning of the website is fantastic. The content that goes along with it is great. The, uh, you know, the photography on the website is incredible. It gives a really great experience to a consumer who has come there for a reason, right? They're coming there because they know the brand, they like the brand, they wanna be further involved in the brand. Third-party retail for a growing artist doesn't make a lot of sense, right? You don't have any control of those things. You don't have that ability to suck people further into you know, your scope of being an artist, which is not only merchandise, but it's the music, the videos, the, the experience. So uh, yeah. It, you know, it makes sense when you're a larger artist to get into third party retail because that's what you're searching for. You're searching for mass and as many t-shirts and units as you could sell. So Spencer, can you talk about like how conscious have you been about the merchandise experience? And, and, and if you could talk about both the experience that your fans get when they do buy merch at your shows, as well as the experience that they're getting either being part of this, this uh, not, what is it, the, the drops on the ninth or just the website in general? I think a lot of it comes down to the marketing around drops when we're talking about internet stuff. We try to, you know, to branch off on the, on the event. We don't just make an ad, Matt. We make basically a movie trailer with, for every single drop. Um, and I don't see a lot of that done. I don't see a lot of uh, video content to promote at least in the rock and roll world. Obviously you see brands like Nike and you know, that's their bread and butter advertising like that. But uh, I think once we started to adapt that and make that part of the equation, I think we started to see a lot more sales. So that's definitely part of the experience. Um, ma making sure that the website is really cool. Um, you know, subtle things like, again, we're a horror band. So whenever you scroll over a piece of our merchandise like blood splatter comes out from behind the merchandise and it's not just a regular cursor on our site it's a butcher knife so little things like that i think um 
you know, make the experience a little bit cooler for people. And also just never being afraid to learn uh, from more popular bands or other bands and see what they're doing. Um, but remembering not to copy them because they are special for a reason. Uh, just kind of looking at, at what they do and maybe trying to learn from it, you know, especially bands that you aspire to be, you know, for us, like, you know, cult bands like Metallica and Slipknot that have those kind of devoted followings. And I think you look at those bands and you see all of their promotion and how their websites function and, and you, you realize that, you know, they're where they are for a reason because they treat every detail, you know, extremely meticulously. When I saw you perform in uh, Dublin, uh, geez, it must have been a year and a half ago, two years ago, uh, I went right to your merch booth afterwards just to see what was going to happen there, where that line that you had uh, to get to your merch, the kids that were lined up, it was an event unto itself, just standing in line waiting for the chance to buy your merch. Is that something that is conscious on your part is that something that just organically has happened as a result of the fans or or, or is it a mix what, what how did that come to be i think it's a it's a just a mixture and and the, the sums of those equations all sort of culminating in, in people being obsessive about the band i think that um the display you know when talking about live shows that's crucial too uh for me, you know, having a great merch guy that understands symmetry, I think symmetry is so important um, in every platform uh, and especially in a live platform, um, making it look like it's the wall at Hot Topic and not sort of a uh, just kind of, a, you know, mishmash of things uh, and, and I, I do this less now because I have less time before shows, but I would usually come out and, and inspect the merch to make sure that things sit right. You know, if it's changing the design in the center to something else, or if these two designs are too similar, not making sure that, that they're next to each other. So I think it, it, it's a combination of all those things and, and creating that experience in, in every respect. Carl, what Spencer's talking about is UX, but in real life, like, but UX has got to be kind of your bread and butter on your website. The people who come to buy from you could buy from the bands individually, but there's a value to coming to your website that's beyond just being an aggregator. So what is it that, that artists miss or that should incorporate that are best practices that you guys use on your website in order to drive sales? I mean, I guess it's sort of a funny question. I mean, for me, I sort of, I mean, I think Ben, when we did our South by panel, however many years ago that was, probably one, but it was probably more like five. Um, <laughs> I always joke about it. It's like, look, any, like the whole thing about the merch company, the first thing I said on stage and I still stand by it is any idiot can print a shirt and anyone can start a big cartel. <laughs> That's the introduction to the merch company. Now, what are you going to do? Right. <laughs> And that's, and I'm not, and I'm not necessarily putting down that aspect. It's just like, <clears throat> you know, I remember, you know, I mean, Mike, you probably did the same thing back in the day. Like I remember printing shirts in our basement, you know, using a paint drying gun to dry the shirts. And then you'd get some, you know, random AOL message about how the shirt fell apart. It's like, well, that's probably because we used a paint dry gun, and not actually like a real dryer. Um, and I think websites, it's a lot like web stores is a lot of the same thing. I mean, as a band is growing, there's not much of an expectation or even much of a demand that you have a really flashy web store. It's just a matter of, you know, the music is the driver. Like that's just, that can't be over, like that, that can't be estimated. Like you can't push that point. You know, I'm trying to think of the right cliche, but like the music is what brings people in. A end of story. Like you can have a great shirt. And we've had examples in the past of bands that, you know, had shirt sales that were far beyond you know, back when Hot Topic was a much bigger component of some of those swings and merchandise. Um, we've had bands who sold t-shirts that were far disproportionate to what their actual sales were and even what their live sales were. Um, occasionally you could do like the one right lucky design and then just boom, you sold, you know, back in the day when you could sell 20,000 shirts at Hot Topic. Um, so we've had that happen, but in terms of the website and in terms of being a band, in terms of the website, I feel like people just need to do 
like there's things we put on the website. There's different items that we've done. We've done different customizing things where you can pick your name and number and, you know, do a custom hockey jersey and get like a proper twill applique NHL style jersey with your name and number on it. And there's all these different little, you know, twists that you can throw in there. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it's just, if you're going to put up a website, make sure you are communicating clearly with people. So if you make a mistake, you communicate with them like, Hey, sorry, here's something, you know, we'll, we'll make up for it. Keep the other shirt. We'll send you this one. Um, I think there's a lot of that, you know, cause I think at the end of the day, if you love a band and you want to buy a shirt from them, if that says kingsroadmerch.com slash band name, or if it says bandmerch.com slash band name, or if it says, you know, bandname.bigcartel.com, whatever it might say, if that's the official site and somebody loves your band and they have the ability to buy something, online they're going to you know and i think like you know not to downplay what emp or even hot topic can do you know because i think amazon's a similar example amazon has their own little customer tower emp definitely has a very loyal customer tower in europe and i think that there's people who would rather buy from them um and there's a lot of examples of that where that the 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 vendor has the branding power and loyalty which is totally cool, but there's no difference between why somebody's buying a shirt from EMP. Like why would somebody buy an Ice Nine shirt, Kills shirt at EMP? It's because they, they are an EMP loyal customer and they like Ice Nine Kills, right? But at the same point in time, there's gonna be a lot of customers who just buy directly from the band, you know? Um, so I don't know that it's necessarily about creating the right website. I think it's just whatever you can control in your environment, do the best that you can in that environment, you know? And take advantage of those other opportunities when they present themselves. Um, but I don't know that having a big cartel or like, oh, you got to have the, you know, you got to have this feature. You got to have that feature. You need to have video in the actual listing. Like those are all things that we've done and, and, and built in. Um, but a lot of it is just more so because the band feels like that shows the item in its best light. It's never so much like, oh, this is, customers are looking for this. It's like, no, we want this because, we have this really crazy box set and we can't show you all the components. We need the unboxing of the box set on the actual listing so people can see it. Um, and I feel like that drives a lot more of our decisions than necessarily like, oh, we were looking up on Amazon and these conversion rates go up, you know, half a percentage point if you do this. It's not, it's not done that way. It's just more so like putting your best foot forward of what feels right, you know? Um, and we have bands where, you know, like Papa Roach had, has video content on the top of the store right now. Um, when they did their interview series around uh, the Infest 20th anniversary, we had that hosted at the top of the page, in addition to all these other outlets that they were doing. Um, so we just do different things like that because that's what the band wants and that's the way the band wants to present themselves. Very cool. Thank you. Ian, like there's a couple things that Carl brings up there. One, you know, just the, the, the website experience and then earlier talking about just making sure that uh, you're findable through Google and, and perhaps doing some uh, social media advertising, that sort of thing. Um, having a great website is one thing. Getting people to that website is another thing altogether. What kinds of things are you doing and employing in order to drive traffic to your artist websites and yeah sure it's, yeah it's, it's intelligent marketing practices so you know paid advertising campaigns uh making sure that you know your adwords are all correct and 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 your product is listed the correct way that your you know your seo is is done the proper way there's a number of different ways to do it um the the simplest way is to you know use the the current method, which is Facebook. Do, do Facebook advertising, you know, take the various outlets that you have. Uh, a lot of the bands that we work with have pretty robust mailing lists, customer lists, et cetera. Uh, you know, do Facebook advertising to those people. Uh, use uh, platforms, you know, some artists choose these platforms like Shopify and their remarketing tactics, uh, card abandonment, you know, uh, emails, et cetera, et cetera. It's, super important to want to draw a consumer to your page uh, to make sure that they are, you know, parting ways with their money uh, and, you know, doing so uh, efficiently. Um, and if they are not, you're reminding them that they haven't and super serving those people who have come to visit you. It's hard to gain a click. <laughs> oh, good. Now, now you've got me writing notes down. I got to have to do a video show people how to do 
cart abandonment re retargeting on Facebook advertising. Yeah. Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, Ben, uh, kind of like, anything that you're hearing from these guys that like, you know, for you is, is like something that from, from sort of merch history just seems to resonate. And it's like one of those things where history should be repeating itself, but maybe isn't, or it is, and people don't even notice it. Well, I mean, these guys have just as much, if not more history than I do, you know, when it comes specific to merchandise. But, you know, one of the things that kind of along the lines of the last um, couple of comments uh, and topics is that, you know, while, while we can spend a lot of time on, you know, design and creative and website, there is a whole other side of this that can't be understated, which is the service side, right? And finding the right partners and finding the right people and finding the right team that once you do gain that click, it's executed and is a beautiful experience for the fan. You know, we're used to that Amazon experience where I one click, boom, it's at my house the next goddamn day. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, fans, people, human beings' expectations on, you know, service is just at a certain level. And I think that needs to be carried through also, whether it's a live event or, you know, uh, e-commerce and the fulfillment, who is your merch rep, like Spencer was talking about? Are they on point? Do they give a shit about their job? You know, do you care about the display? You know, these are really the, the I would, it's like when you're out there on the road, you know, the merch stand is the second most valuable piece of real estate after the stage for an artist, right? You know, it's like, so, so pay attention to the details. And, and again, back to the Ice Nine Kill scenario, where it's like all those details about the blood splatter and the cursor, it's, it just shows that you care, you know, and, and fans, re that resonates with fans. And so the merch stand should look like you care, put it on body molds, have good lighting. You're trying to sell something here, you know, put it, the same thing with the e-commerce side, make sure it's cool. And then once you get that click, make sure you have the team that can do the rest, carry it over the finish line. You know, um, you have a good product. You're, you actually care about the size of the shirts, you know, the sizing of the shirts and the quality of the shirts. Because the worst experience is buying a shirt from a band, you put it on, you're like, I'm never wearing this shirt again. <laughs> you know, like it's just, it's just, you know, uncomfortable, whatever. So I think that, you know, there's a lot and that's, that's just consistent. And so, yeah, anybody can print a t-shirt and sell it on a website or sell it at a show, but it's, it's the service side of this industry that needs to be, you know, highlighted and appreciated and given a lot of consideration because that kind of rounds out the whole fan experience in the, 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 the circle in and around merchandise. And we see it all the time. I mean, we work with, you know, a lot of different folks in different companies and, you know, we can, we can see the, the artists, especially when they're out there on the road that are being super served by their merchandise companies and, and they're crushing it, you know, they're crushing it out there. So. That's awesome. Uh, Mike, like when it comes to Ice Nine Kills, where they are now, as they say, Rome wasn't built in a day. That that was something that you and Spencer spent years building to. The the things that like Ben's talking about, just constantly having good quality merchandise and having a good quality experience. So, what types of compromises or choices? Uh, or things that perhaps were a little bit more expensive when it, you really wish they weren't in the early years of the Ice Nine Kills story that are paying off now. Yeah, I mean, you know, Spencer's always been a big dreamer and wanted to do things, you know, some of the small stuff that we're talking about now, it wasn't an efficient use of our resources necessarily to get a custom website built, um, you know, to have blood splatter happen. So even though, you know, he has always had these kind of um, <clears throat> out of the box ideas. It, you know, new ones have opened, or the opportunity to implement them has opened up as, you know, the bands continue to grow. Um, you know, what I like about it is he, you know, it's been a lot of fun, right? As, as the band continues to grow, we just have so much that we can sort of experiment with and play with and, um, you know, pull in influences from other places. But, you know, I think early on it was, it, it still was, how do we, at, within the resources we have, find the best designer? And, you know, part of Ice Nine Kill's success across the board has been a consistent reinvestment of profits back into the machinery, no matter what it is, but especially in the merchandise um, component. It's not, you know, not stepping over um, a dollar, you know, now to, to, 
to get a dime or whatever that one is. Stepping over a dime to get a dollar. One of those. You guys know what I'm talking about. Dimes and dollars. Oh, you can get a koozie for a dime. That's what the first one. <laughs> I, think, I think it goes. I think it goes. I think it goes for the first one. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and that can be challenging to do. You know, um, with developing artists, it it's you know it's hard when you want some sort of payoff and sometimes just need some sort of payoff. It can be really challenging to take the money. I mean, you know, we've invested pretty heavily in um, social media marketing and e-commerce, and you know, the team that we've hired has a really good approach. You know, let's go in and take a certain percentage of the profits and just reinvest that. That way, we're not having to consume all of it and and pull all of it back in. But let's take, you know, um, they've got some, you know, thankfully they work with a lot of clients, so they've got their own best practices and know what really works to continue to to you know move the 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 level. Carl uh, Spencer and, uh, was talking earlier about using video to make an event out of the merchandise. You mentioned. Uh, uh, one of your other uh, clients was doing that on King's Road uh, recently as well. Is there a level that an artist needs to get to before that type of event, making an event of a merch uh, sale makes sense? Or is this something that is sort of um, uh, the, the biggest do it for a reason and it's, that's what makes them the biggest? Is there something about those artists who aren't selling perhaps the huge uh, 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 quantities on your website that it's not so much because of them, it's because of their lack of sort of oomph behind their, their marketing. Can you talk about the difference between those who are selling a lot versus those who are not? I mean, I think it all, I feel like a lot of that stuff kind of fits into the components of like the story of where the band is and kind of what they're focusing on at that time. Um, you know, I think, I think a lot of bands would like to do more video, but I think, you know, the biggest concern, I mean, even pre pandemic kind of economy that bands are living in really comes down to budget and time and honestly ideas too. Um, you know, cause I don't think every, not every band, even if the band has a clear idea of what they want to see uh, or what they want to put forward in terms of how they want to market the, the merchandise or, or, you know, market anything. Um, there's a level of comfort, you know, in the same way, not every band feels comfortable doing VIP. Some bands kill it at VIP. Some bands are totally wired to that experience and that aspect of being a band where there's a lot of bands who, who grew and got to a higher level before VIP was even really a component of a band's income. I think video is a, a similar thing in a lot of ways. Cause there's a lot of bands who just don't want to be in front of the camera or don't have video type ideas. And I think one of the worst things you can do when putting those things out there is to do it and then not do a good job because there is a bit of a fine line on that where it's like, if you have a clear vision, you know, and I think music videos are a similar way, but I think specifically when it comes to like promoting merch, creating content for social media or just marketing in general, whether it's merchandise or whether it's a tour or whatever. Um, if you don't have a clear idea, less is more. And I think that works with merch. I think it works with merch lines. I think it works with marketing. It works in a lot of ways. Like if you're, there's nothing worse than like stretching for an idea that you're not either totally invested in or totally comfortable with or have a fully flushed out idea. Um, because sometimes you might get lucky, but you know, no, there's no examples that come to my head right now, but, but, but missing the mark on those kind of things, it's wasted money. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's a couple hundred bucks or even maybe it's more than that, you know, whether, whether you have a person who does video and photo permanently on staff or not, just there's a lot of bands who just don't even really want to spend the money because there's, you know, the margin of return on that where it's like, all right, if I'm going to spend, I'm just going to pick a number out for easy rounding, but a thousand dollars on a video, we're going to use it, you know, one bit a week. There's some bands where that budget makes total sense because it's like, well, you figure the royalty rates, you figure what we're going to do in, in, in sales, and this is going to generate an additional amount of sales. There's not a lot of bands willing to uh, put their money into those kind of endeavors. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's just, I think each, each component just has to be a level of, it's a, you know, merchandise is a part of an, you know, the entire story of where a band is. And, uh, you know, right now, Usually e-commerce is sort of just, you know, Ian's worked at a merch company. 
you guys have, you know, being in bands and, and, and seeing the numbers, it's like live is, is the, the volume business of being any level of band, you know, uh, if you're in a band that sells $500 a merchant night, your web store is probably not doing 500 bucks a day, right? It's just that those numbers are pretty consistent in that like if you're doing $10,000 a merchant night, your web store is still not doing $10,000 that day. Um, and so, you know, having that overall component right now with e-commerce being one of the sole areas of, of quick monetization for bands, um, I would still keep in mind like, there will be a world a year from now and just spend your money in a way that, you, you know, feels right. Um, that's really the best way to do it. So yeah, we've had some bands do video. We've had some bands do, you know, funny stuff. We've had bands do funny shirts. We have bands that don't like to do a lot of comedic stuff uh, or even get like tongue in cheek at all, you know? So it's just each situation is different. Some bands just kind of lay in the background um, and you could never get them in front of a camera unless you're pulling their teeth out. You know, <laughs> there's no, the, each combat each band is different and so i think if you have a true vision um and you're at a level where there's actually a, a larger audience where you can do those kind of things and experiment and sometimes take a couple punches like oh that didn't really work we don't need to do that again um you know i think that i think that sometimes you just have to be willing to know what your your vision is and let those decisions kind of fall from that Ian, can you talk about that a little bit? Like the idea of, I love this, this, this these ideas from, from uh, the, there's idea and then there's execution. And I guess my question is, which is a bigger challenge for your clients? And then uh, when you know that there are compromises that will need to happen with execution, how do you tailor the ideas so that way none of these uh, attempts don't end up uh, either half completed or or just uh, uh, being unusable and done. Yeah, it's a really good question, and I see Mike chuckling over there because our whole lives are spent in that middle ground between idea and execution. <laughs> uh, so you know, look, and and you have a perfect grouping of people here to do it. Uh, all of these guys here are experts in execution. Um, Spencer is an expert in ideas and execution, Ben's execution, Carl's execution, Mike, everybody, like, you know, we have a really good topic here to discuss because I think that the most important thing to do as a young artist is what we've been discussing here, really understanding the idea, really understanding the vision. If you don't do that, there's pieces that become gray, right? There's areas of the business that become gray and they become, you know, areas where you have to focus more effort on or bring additional people in to help supplement what you can't, you know, figure out on your own. Um, as a younger artist, you always want to, you know, understand your brand, your brand concept, what, you know, what your logo looks like, what your colors look like, what your social voice is, what your, you know, your musical voice is, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have to find people that supplement um, those different areas. Um, for instance, you know, I manage a band called Papa Roach, great band. They've been around a heck of a long time. They had a big issue, um, probably about five or so years ago where from a merchandise perspective, they didn't understand who they were. They kind of knew what they liked when they saw it, but they didn't have a way to explain, you know, how, how to get there. Right. So they, they knew that their fans bought a certain color t-shirt. It's black. No surprise. They knew that their uh, fans liked a particular type of music, had a particular type of lifestyle. You know, they have a great, huge, amazing history of, you know, millions of records sold and everything like that. You would think that a band of that stature really could understand what they visually could represent. They had a problem. Uh, we brought Carl in as a partner and Kings Road has been an excellent partner for us um, in kind of taking that, taking what the data says is great about a band like Papa Roach and taking the lifestyle of those fans and making consistent, concise, really well done, important designs uh, and profitable products. So that's just a, a small example of what every artist will deal with in any scale, right? If it's a small baby band who's just trying to figure out what their logo is up to maybe not Metallica, they know what they're doing, but you know, other bands that, that sort of struggle with that similar identity crisis on a cycle basis, on a yearly basis, on a whatever it is. I'm sure Spencer can walk through those, those types of things too. 
Well, th thanks for that, Ian. And uh, uh, Spencer, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to transition just a little bit, but I want to stick with this idea of idea versus execution. Uh, at what point in your career did you feel like you could execute a really great VIP program? And in retrospect, did you do it too early, too late, or was it right on time? I think it's it all comes down to, to timing, and uh, as Mike said before, it's like you you can you got to make sometimes a thousand mistakes before something works, and uh, that that's always sort of been built into the DNA of the band. You know, let let's try this, let's try that, and uh, kind of crossing the line sometimes to define it. I think uh, goes a long way, and. Uh, I think just overall, we started to see uh, more success with merchandise when uh, we stopped following the trends, of pretty much everything, um, music, um, merchandise. And I, I think that, that that's, that's the key. And that's like, the, that's the hardest thing to do, in my opinion, is finding your identity and, uh, and, and, and taking that to the next level, because I think a lot of bands make the mistake of, um, of trying to copy. And I think that, you know, learning from other bands' success is a very different thing than copying what they're doing. And I think really pa paving, paving our own lane was what, when we really started to, to see that growth. And uh, it sort of coincided with when I think we found our unique sound and vision which was uh on the every trick in the book album cycle where we had a clear defined theme and and uh started to build that and and then i think really came into our own with the music and the merchandise on the on the last album because it had a, a a broader appeal and uh yeah that's when i think it, it kind of took that turn and what about a vip program i think you know, we, we've done VIP for, for years. And Mike, I think we started doing that maybe, I don't know, I want to say 2013 or 14 when we, when it was sort of becoming uh, the norm. I think we were actually a little bit of ahead of the curve on that. I think we started doing it um, before everyone was doing it. And uh, it's cool to see the growth there. I remember, you know, doing, doing a show in Austin, Texas, where there's like, you know, three VIP. And, it, you know, just having them in our, in our dressing room and being like, oh, we got three today. It's better than one. <laughs> um, and, that, and now seeing it grow to a point where I think, you know, we have to cap them out because they're selling out. You know, some of them, I think we had like over 100 on some of the last headliners. And uh, I think it, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great tool, and I think everyone should use it. Um, I don't really know if um, – there's too early of a time to use it because I don't think you, you know until you get out in the field and start seeing what the results are. I don't know if it's like a bad look for a band to do a VIP and, and no one shows up, but, you know, it could be. Uh, but I think there, there, there are clever ways to sort of uh, not hide that, but, you know, maybe say there's only three kids there, you know, say that that was capped at three. It's a great trick. <laughs> got a couple other think, people in the room I, envious of three people. I think you're doing all right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, and I think the point, I just want to chime in on the point that Spencer had said about like copying people because I can testify 100% from experience of being in a band that, you know, at the time we were playing in, you know, what I guess, what, Mike, I guess metalcore world, I guess is the simplest way to describe it. Sure. Uh, you know, we spent a lot of time with bands that, you know, grew well beyond our level. And, uh, you know, when you're in that moment and you're in the van and you're in Denver and you're playing second of four and the band that's headlining the show, it's like, hey, like you guys were the same size as us not that long ago and you see this band on this trajectory, it's natural just to be like, okay, well, what are they doing, right? This is what they're wearing on stage. Like there wasn't too much production at that point. You know, bands weren't like, the, the, the level of investment into production now is much greater at a smaller level. Um, so at the time, you know, it was all house lights and, you know, you have a backdrop. Well, is your backdrop big? Is your backdrop small? Um, like, you know, oh, they have, they have some lights on them. They have lights behind the drum set. Like, that's crazy, you know? And so you go through this whole thing of just like, it's very easy to get sucked into that. 
and just go, well, what are they doing? You know, and not, not and like you're saying, learning from other bands success is completely different than like, well, they're doing this and got to them, got them to that level. You know, for us, we had nobody in the band that could sing. And there was a lot of bands that were singing and adding singing later in the game. And it's like, you know, you're chasing all these different things instead of just looking at your own road and your own focus. And I always say like, you know, one of the, one of the greatest compliments that I can give to, you know, Parkway Drive using them as an example is that they're a band who got overlooked, got, you know, looked over on tours they might not have gotten the respect that they deserved, you know, at the time when they were kind of starting out. And now they're one of the biggest bands in heavy music. And there's never a point where they were, they were like, I guarantee you there are moments, maybe even internally, like I've never asked them, but like there's moments probably where they're like, should we be, you know, just in our, in our Hurley shorts and Hurley shirts? Like we're playing with all these bands that aren't in that. And we're not, we're a very heavy band, but they just always did what felt right to them. And that's like, you know, and it's gotten to them, gotten them pretty damn far. And so I think there's a lot to be said about that because, you know, they surpassed and, and toured with the bands that I toured with at the same time. And now they're at this level. And so much of it is just from them always trusting their gut and trusting the people that were with them as they've grown and never second guessing the fact that's like, I want to wear flip flops on stage. I'm going to wear fucking flip flops on stage. <laughs> well, you know? I mean, like I'm going to play these riffs. You came here for our music. I'm going to wear some flip flops. Now, were they selling flip flops at the merch table? One of my first one of my first pre orders with them in this position was uh, was flip flops. It, <laughs> I had to do. Is it okay? <laughs> ben, I feel bad to like you know to go from you know these two guys talking about like you know how you feel about whether something's right. What about that cold, hard data that tells you? When it's <laughs> I mean, that's that's a it's a it's a really good question, and um, and we take the position of not having an opinion, just sharing the data, you know, and saying this is what we see, you know, this is not Ben Brannon's opinion, you know, on what the state of the industry is. It's this is what it is, and you can do with that as you please. There's anomalies to everything, right? This is just the averages. This is, you know, a, a, a bar for you to, you know, rate yourself against your dollars per head. Are they above? Or are they below? Are you know, when you're looking at genre based on venue capacity, gross merchandise sales for a headlining artist, how are you trending? You know, are these indicators that can help you tweak the dials a little bit to refine, you know, whatever it is that you're doing. And so that that's our goal is, is we're not a merch company. We're not the artist. We're not management. We're not the ones making the decision, but if provide some information that helps, you know, helps those folks uh, make decisions, you know, or, or lead people to a certain path. That's, that's what we aim to do, you know, and, you know, the, the, you know, the debate that comes up all the time is do more items, make more money, you know, like, do I bring more stuff out on the road? And, you know, no, you know, the answer is no. And when we release that, that, um, you know, the, the stat that four items generate 75% of the revenue, you have to think about every additional item in there and the cost associated with that, not just in cost of goods, but also the space in the trailer and the time to count it in. And, and, and we all know that, you know, the name of the game, especially on artist Ben shows is move the fans as fast as you can through there because, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's all about the transaction time. You know, and, and two, it's a shitty thing if you have a line of fans still and the, the club's like, out, you got to go. You know, it's like, that's a bummer for the fan. And so the more items you have, the longer it takes them to make up their mind, you know, um, and they show up and say, can I get the Ice Nine Kill shirt? Yes. Which one? The black one. Got it. But then you know that. <laughs> you know? So, so the, you know, so seriously, I mean, there, there, there's case studies that we've worked on where the most more focused the the uh, merchandise line is, the faster the transactions are. You know, you're helping the kids make the decisions um, faster, and they're they're rolling through. That doesn't mean you can't have diversity in that line, but and the, and the, and it's different at different stages of each band too. You know, um, so you kind of look at where are where are you at? What does the data show you? And then you know, when we released that, every merchandise company was like thing we've been saying this for God damn, how many years have we been saying this <laughs> you know but then it becomes a conversation between management and artists of whether or not that is what works for that artist you know and their vision of what that merchandise line is so that's kind of our, our you know 
our, our position in, in sharing some of this information with everybody. So like, like we, we all, like with data, you can almost tell any story you want, if you just uh, augment it just the way you want it, or you look at this metric instead of that one. I mean, are you looking specifically at like item SKUs, like this one is selling and it's doing its thing. And then sort of the, the, the second question sort of as a follow up on that is, how can an artist know when it's time to move on, even for an item that might still be selling? I can't imagine there was a time where Metallica stopped selling tons of what was his, those plus head shirts back in the eighties, you know, but at some point they went, you know, we just got to move on and then brought it back later, you know? Yeah. And I think that that's, that is a very much a case by case basis. While we, have all this information on the unique items that are sold on an item by item basis, we don't share that information. You know, that's private to the band and the merch company and that's their data. Um, we aggregate everything and in, in an anonymous, uh, anonymous way so that we can share it with, with folks on trends, right? What are the overarching trends here? Black tour t-shirts sell the most, you know? Um, so we don't get into those details, but that's where going back to my previous comment about service, you know, and the merch company, and how they service their artists, it's looking at everything on a you know skew basis for an artist to identify whether or not something is trending up or down. Is it time to put this item to to bed, or you know do we keep uh, rolling this thing out? And I think that for for a lot of folks too, you know the the you know it's interesting because we started this top sellers you know um, award for small and mid cap artists, and looking back at each one of those artists compared to some of their brethren in that range, they all have some pretty consistent themes, which is, you know, merchandise, tight merchandise lines. I mean, Ice Nine Kills, like you guys have a tight merchandise line, you know, it's, it's not, you know, I don't go there and see 30 black t-shirts sitting on the wall, you know, and it's consistent with a lot of the, the bands that we saw continue to evolve through the various size venues. They have, they have imagery that's great, great product. It speaks to them and their fans. It's, it has an identity and it's, it's tight, you know? Um, so I think it, you know, in terms of what the actual item is and when do we swap things out, you know, that's up to management artists and the merchandise company looking at your specific trends, your specific data points, and also is it consistent with the next album cycle? You know, so that there, there's, again, like this is the data, but you know, it's not a rule for, that applies to every scenario for each band, I think, is the best way to think about that. Awesome. And I want to talk about albums and, and the album cycle in just a minute. I hope you guys are willing to stay for a few extra minutes because I sure. know we're at time. Uh, uh, Mike, real quick, uh, uh, one of the things that Ben was talking about there was um, uh, just know, you know, knowing what, your fan, what the fans want. And with Spencer doing the drops for Ice Nine Kills, it seems like if, if I were an artist that doesn't yet have that kind of a fan base, I could do drops in the forms of pre-orders just to find out whether people are actually going to like a design or not without going through the expense of actually manufacturing it. Is that something that uh, artists at just a, at, a, at, a, at a lower level trying to get to Spencer's level, that stuff like that, what other types of like ideas should they be utilizing to discover before they go the, through the expense of production, whether something's going to sell or not? Yeah, I mean, I, it's definitely a, an option. You know, the challenge that you've got to be cognizant of there is how long does it take, you know, from the pre-order to fulfillment? As somebody else indicated, we're in the Amazon economy. And, you know, we can get away with quite a bit with Ice Nine, especially with that line, because, uh, you know, we've got a trained fan base and we spend a lot of time on the quality of those items. So people are willing to wait. But um, for a smaller band, that could be challenging. You know, one of the things that we used to do, we don't have to do it as much, was survey our fans, right? It was either through a direct survey or just a social media survey. You know, there's always a challenge between, would I like to buy this? And am I going to buy this? Those are two different things, as we all know. And as Ian, I think, stated, you know, you lose people along the, the journey of, you know, the purchase journey. Um, you know, we lose people. We study that stuff, you know, with Ice Nine to try to improve it. Um, because as we continue to, you know, grow the number of people that are coming in, we want to be able to convert each one and then also, you know, Spencer, this, this is off of that topic, but one thing that 
hasn't been mentioned that I've been thinking about, you know, Spencer's merch guy is the master of the upsell, right? When Ben's talking about throw the koozie in with the shirt, you know, we've got a guy who knows every combination that, you know, is really getting at least two items into the hands of every single person. And we've had people come back and say, you know, on social media, like, oh, thank God, you know, that guy convinced me to get this item because, you know, I don't know when I'm going to see Ice Nine again, or it was only limited on this tour or whatever it may be. And we do that in the, in the online capacity as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think for developing artists, you know, these tools exist. They're just uh, sometimes in a little bit of a different um, medium and, um, you know, trial and error. And, and uh, you know, as we've talked about specific to the coaching platform is, you know, look, the experts on this panel, you know, those are my resources to go to. When I was in a band, when Carl talks about our bands playing with each other, it's like, yeah, I would go to the dudes in other bands and ask them what works and what doesn't. And, um, you know, that's a way for, for the developing artists to connect is within their own little community or in the online community. Hey, what's working for you? What isn't working? Yeah. Mike, I can't believe it's an hour in and I, I haven't asked anybody about upselling. That's, I'm so glad you brought that up. So is there anything strategic about the way things are priced at the merch booth that lends itself to those upsells? A $25 item next to a $15 item, for example. Yeah, I mean, I, I, if the question's to me, absolutely. Um, and we get to play with that. And, you know, the nice thing is we also you know, have liberty and trust the merch person enough to swing and, and make deals and do all of the things that he needs to do. You know, Ben kind of made a comment of, I think, uh, you know, I can't remember what the term was, but you know, the, the band selling like artists sell, I think is what he said, mm -hmm. you know, we've watched our experience when our artist isn't selling, right. When our merch rep isn't selling, we've gone in and we've got to turn that over to somebody that happens in certain venues or on certain tours, you know, typically, uh, our conversion goes down, our per head goes down. Part of that is we're in different environment. Other things are more expensive, the ticket itself, the parking, the beer, whatever it may be. But also it's, yeah, I mean, no offense to the dude who's selling it. He's just there to do a job, but he doesn't know, right, right. what things go together and, and how to convince, how to speak to our fan in the language that is so important. Carl, tell me about upselling off a website. How do you do it? I mean, the cynical answer is, what do we have a lot of? <laughs> I mean, that's usually, that's usually the answer. I mean, let's be honest. Uh, what's, our, what's, our, what's our most attractive mistake that we can put into upsell? Um, you know, just each, it's again, like I think the, 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 uh, the string of mistakes that you can make in times, like you just have enough successes to outweigh those and occasionally you just have to get creative. And, and um, you know, I think the merch booth upsell is totally different than the online upsell. I mean, we've had items that we've done upsells for, we've tested it where it's like, hey, did you know that this existed? Uh, check this out, it's, you know, for you, it's like we discounted like a dollar, you know, but just like putting it in front of people's faces and it, it, it's like, because people don't like to click that much, um, sometimes it's just a matter of, of reminding people something exists. I think at the, uh, I think in a, a live setting, you know, um, for smaller bands, especially, cause I feel like, let's say, you know, hypothetically, most of the people watching this aren't going to be in, you know, bands that are playing 3000 cat venues, wondering what they can do differently. I think there's a certain level of just having, um, you know, two things that go together, you know, the shirt and the koozie, like that's mm -hmm. always, this our shirt and a tote you know, a shirt and something to carry the shirt away. And, and you have those kind of things that go together um, and have it round up to be two bills. You know, if that's the best case scenario. Now, granted, you can credit cards. It doesn't really matter. And credit cards are becoming more and more prevalent thanks to Ben's constant pushing of them on everybody. <laughs> but like the, uh, the, the ability to get a square reader and a venue reader is much easier now than it was, you know, say even five years ago. And so you know, having things that rounded up to 40 or having things that rounded up to, you know, 30, but just don't price your stuff in $2 increments. You know, don't, don't create a lot of change. Don't create a lot of time for the, for the seller. Cause as much as the, the people in the line, like the people that are there, they're going to be fine giving you $30 if the price was going to be 28, you know, and it's just, it's a, it's just 
not even so much like nobody's retiring off of that two dollars, but it's a matter of the speed, the ease, and the ability to go. Oh, that you know, I'll take that twenty dollars shirt and get a you know a tote, you know, or a twenty five dollars shirt and a five dollar koozie. Um, and I think that you know, again, it's just a matter of what makes sense at the time, you know, given the situation, because you can't do a lot of upselling in a venue sell. You know, they're not going to be there and they're like, hey, you buy this shirt, I'll give you this for five bucks. Like that's not their, that's not their game. Yeah. But uh, I just, gonna, this isn't a question. I just want to make sure that everybody watching this knows you must be able to take credit cards at your uh, merch booth. You just have to, because I never walk around with cash and I want your staff. Um, uh, Ian, all right, so we're talk we've been talking about the upsell. The next version of the upsell is the bundle, and I had hinted at wanting to ask about album cycles. The billboard rules have changed. How are you going to better utilize bundles so that it is either advantageous or just not as bad as it uh uh, could be <laughs> for your artists uh, after the billboard rule changes? Uh, I Great question. Um, I might uh, piss off a lot of managers when I say this, but, you know, for me, the billboard charts don't necessarily matter. We're in the business of creating revenue for our artists and, you know, having a billboard chart number that's slightly higher or slightly lower isn't going to make or break our artist business. So we're focused on, you know, values that, that create, um, you know, bundles that create uh, value, perceived value, excellent products for the fans, great, you know, pieces that all make sense within the, the marketing of the artist scheme because you're trying to create a fan, you know, I mean, creating fans happens in that place. It doesn't necessarily happen if, you know, I see your name in the top 200 of Billboard. Um, so in my opinion, I would focus on great value, pricing your products correctly, creating perceived value by, you know, adding details like incredible packaging or, you know, throw-ins, uh, you know, that kind of stuff, I think really moves the needle more than like, you know, putting a big number up on billboard, although it is important and record labels really like it and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Spencer, what's your perspective on bundles? I mean, you got this thing wrapped up great. Uh, how do you approach what goes into a bundle and how you price it? Yeah, I think that w when we use bundles, it's usually, and Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, we usually do that pretty much only when we're dropping a new record uh, and bundle that with with the record. But uh, we've seen great, great success with it. And I think that it's all about not overwhelming the customer with too many options for bundles. You know, I, I think that Less is more a lot of the time, uh, and especially when it comes to, to that idea with merch. Uh, but making sure it's clear that there is a price break. If you, if you buy this bundle, you're going to save money as opposed to buying each one of those items. I think um, some of the cooler items, making those only available in bundles is sometimes that sort of icing on the cake to, to seal the deal for someone buying that bundle. And it... it comes down to a lot with consistency. You know, it's something that we haven't touched on too much yet is great artists that you work with. Um, and I think uh, we're in a position where I don't know how many bands are like us, but we basically only use one artist, pretty much only one guy. Uh, his name's Mike Cortada. And uh, he was strategically chosen because I thought that what he did with bands like A Day to Remember, with bands like Pierce the Veil, you know, he really, I think, um, had a lot to do with building their identity and branding. And uh, he's our go-to man. And, and sometimes Mike and I will see a design someone else did, and uh, we'll think it's great. But then, you know, bringing it over to Mike, he's got that that extra, he's got that third eye, you know, where he can he can see that, it's, you know, it's not fashionable, it's flea market. And uh, I think uh, having someone on the team like that um, is, is incredibly valuable. And uh, especially when it comes to bundles, because they have that eye for what items work together. Um, and also we've got, we've got a great team at uh, Absolute Merch that uh, 
we've really sort of established, established like a checks and balance system with everything. There's, you know, six to seven people that everything goes through when we're, we're deciding uh, about merch drops and bundles and all that stuff. So it's, it's a cool, uh, very open dialogue between our team. Um, and I, I think that for us, at least texting is the best way having those group texts. It's not email where you don't have to go into your email. Cause I find, you know, the way Gmail is set up in the last few years, just is a nightmare to find things, find attachments and stuff. So we have a very open dialogue uh, about that stuff. Awesome. Uh, ben, like uh, we're going to wrap up really soon, but there's been a whole bunch of ideas here. And so I wanted to ask you sort of two questions. One, is there anything that, you know, that we haven't covered that to you screams of a missed opportunity that we definitely need to address? And then uh, sort of second, and it's a, almost a whole nother question. We just had a panel recently about booking and we had promoters and booking agents and everybody talking about how they're bracing for the live experience to change. Is there anything about the live merch experience that you think may change in the wake of lockdown and coronavirus? Um, the, well, first part of that question, I don't, I don't know that there's anything obvious that we, um, you know, that we've missed on this panel in terms of, you know, the, the things, especially for the audience watching, you know, that you just need to be uh, focused on and consistent with and meticulous about. And there's a lot of really good expertise and advice that has been shared here for, you know, any young artists and any artist to, to take away and, and, and apply those, those uh, lessons to, to their career. In terms of live, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're in constant we're in constant uh, communication with all of our merchandise partners, both on the venue on the venue side, the festival side, the uh, merchandise artists uh, side, and uh, the best the, the short answer is nobody knows. You know, nobody knows what's what this is going to look like. Nobody knows when this is going to come back to life. Um, but there is a, uh, there's going to have to be, one thing for sure is there's going to have to be some quick and immediate adaptability to the environment, you know? And so what that means is when venues start coming back on, on board, are they trying to implement social distancing? If they are, what does that mean for a merch stand now? You know, um, a lot of the venue operators are talking about going totally cashless. You know, we're not dealing with cash. We don't want to handle cash, uh, you know, for the safety of our fans and for the safety of our staff. We're not dealing with it. How does merch, the merchandise stand become as contactless as possible so that, you know, whether it's Live Nation or AEG or, or you know, the troop or whoever can go to their city officials and say, these are the measures we're putting in place to keep the staff safe and the fans safe. And that's going to have to do with parking. It's going to have to do with concessions. It's going to have to do with the merchandise stand. So we're all learning in real time, adapting in real time. That venue is certainly, you know, feeding information from the different merchandise companies to the venues, the venues to the merchandise companies. Can we come up with kind of a general consensus of how we can play ball? A lot of the venue then operators are, you know, hey, can we consolidate the merchandise line? So you're not coming in with 30 items. You're coming in with whatever the appropriate amount is so that we're moving the lines faster. We're also not counting three times as many t-shirts as we need to count. We're not handling more boxes, you know, every day. So, so again, nobody knows for sure, but these are the themes and the trends that we're hearing from all of our partners on how do we make it a safer environment for fans and for staff. Um, and, and at the same time, maybe introduce some new opportunities for contactless payments and, and et cetera. So from a technology perspective, we're certainly looking at this as, you know, how do we, how do we encourage that transaction to go faster? How do we encourage, you know, fans to potentially purchase from their phone and pick it up at a different location? You know, we've done some of that on the festival side, Bottle Rock as an example, where a VIP suite holder can snap a QR code, place their order, and somebody comes bringing their merchandise to them. Are there ways where we can adapt? Not that that's the model that's going to work, but are there ways where we can, you know, adapt some of that technology into these different environments? So, um, it's, uh, and it also depends on timing. You know, when are they actually gonna let us come back to work? When can we actually start to have some shows and rock and roll back? Um, but I think that some of those things, everyone's just gonna have to, um, uh, you know, uh, absorb information in real time and adapt to whatever the situation may be. 
Yeah, cashless uh, merch booth finally means that that I think that's going to be something we're we're definitely going to see a big push for is the cashless merch booth. So, Mike, besides Ben's suggestion that you use a T-shirt cannon as your delivery system, <laughs> right? what else? I mean, if, uh, what else uh, do you want to wrap up? Uh, this is for me. I my mind's been blown <laughs> a dozen times. So, thank you guys all. But, Mike, a couple uh, takeaways. Can you wrap us up a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I, I think as we're wrapping up, I mean, so much good advice from all of these guys. You know, um, to me, the real takeaway is how do you, how does somebody out there that's trying to do some of the things that we've talked about build a team like this of people that can influence them, right? You know, at Venue, I can call Ben, but Ben's a busy guy, so I can go to his website where he publishes things about best practices. You know, there's other resources that guys like Carl, you know, go sniff around at the various um, fulfillment places. Um, you know, uh, whatever, Absolute Merch, as Spencer mentioned, Kings Road Merch, our friends at Merch Now, there's Second City, there's tons of other ones. But like, you know, we go to places like rockabilia.com and go to amazon.com and look at where people are, you know, Spencer mentioned Supreme and things like that, but I'm, I'm talking about bringing it a little bit more close to home. Um, and, you know, establish a relationship with people that are in each of these roles. That way, when you're trying to, to you know, make some decisions, um, you can get some, some really strong and valid opinions. I mean, you know, the beautiful thing is, you know, it's, been an exciting time to be a developing artist because as you can hear from an artist like Spencer who's no longer developing you know so many of the tools are still in his hands and that's kind of the beauty is if you're willing to take the advice of guys like this build a team around you and you know do some trial and error and just be persistent um, you know the chances of figuring out a model that works for you um, are are actually pretty uh, they're pretty simple, but require a lot of work to do. Guys, uh, if you don't mind sticking around for another six hours, I got a few more questions. Um, <laughs> the sun I, is set in most people's houses I'm, by now. Yeah, I'm trying to block the, <laughs> the west window. I didn't quite plan that. Yeah, Spencer's getting <laughs> hammered over there, man. <laughs> only, only Ben has sunlight whenever he wants it. Hi. Good grand. <laughs> Thank you all very, very much. I really greatly appreciate all of your time and, and sharing your wisdom. Really, really appreciate it and hope we can uh, get a chance to, to uh, uh, spend some more time with you again in the future. So thank you. Absolutely. Sure. Thanks, oh, yeah. Thank Thanks, you guys. Appreciate right, it. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, guys.